Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. Thank you so much for joining us. And we have the just literally immeasurable pleasure and honor of having with us one of my dearest, most admired and revered friends and exemplars of conflict resolution, of consultation on the hardest of all societal, political system questions, and just an incredibly wonderful, wonderful human being. Andy Weiner, the governor's consultant on the Maui Fires programs. He could not possibly have picked a better, more qualified, more motivated, dedicated person in the universe to do that. Hey, Andy, welcome. <clears throat> where are we on one Ohana Maui Fires recovery, and where are we headed? Thanks, Chuck. It's great to be here, and I really do appreciate the, the introduction. Very kind of you, but it's uh, it's also nice to be able to have a conversation with somebody who I think appreciates the the hard work that's going to be necessary, you know, for the state to to take on a tragedy as large as Maui, and to hopefully from that tragedy, you know, do some things that the state will uh, be able to look back on years from now and be proud of. And I think that we do have that that opportunity. Um, let me start by talking a little bit about the One Ohana Fund, just to remind um, anybody that's watching uh, this, this uh, broadcast. Um, we set up the One Ohana Fund back in the fall. We received contributions of $175 million from a variety of partners, um, Kamehameha Schools, Maui County, Wine Electric, uh, Charter Spectrum, Hawaiian Tel, and, and some other private landowners. And the idea behind it was that the governor wanted to set up a humanitarian-based fund to provide victims' families with the option of choosing a settlement that would be done expeditiously and be done without the usual um, type of, of process that you have to go through when you're litigating. And so we were blessed to have Judge Ronnie Barra, a retired judge from the Big Island, agreed to serve as the fund administrator. And the basic contours of the of the One Ohana Fund is that each of the families that lost a loved one in the fire, um, and there are 101 of them, uh, they have the ability uh, to apply for $1.5 million in compensation, and that that compensation uh, will come relatively quick. Uh, we're, we're now ready to start uh, moving that machinery forward. And then we also set up a second category, uh, a $25 million fund for those that were most seriously injured. Um, and those were individuals that either ended up in the hospital or received medical treatment within the first 48 hours of the, of the fire. So that is the, 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 the background of the One Ohana Fund. And it opened up on March 1st, as you know, we, we had a We've had a few chances to talk about this. And since March 1st, uh, I'm, I'm proud to report that as of yesterday, uh, we have 49 applications from families that are seeking compensation uh, for the loss of a loved one and 19 uh, serious personal injury claims. And, and so we are unclear for the serious personal injury claims how many people that there that would fit into that category. But we actually think that that number is surprisingly low and may only be as many as 30 or 35 at the most. And so we think that we have captured already more than half of the personal injury cases and we're, we're just about at half for uh, the, the wrongful death cases and the families of, of those victims. So that's, that's where we are, at least in terms of the numbers. And that's amazing because in California, it took them five to eight years and forcing the utility into bankruptcy with very, very adverse long-term consequences for the utility, for energy in California and for that we cannot afford here. <clears throat> Whereas we're not even approaching one year and you have the process in place, you have the mechanism in place, you have almost half of the death cases and a very substantial proportion of the injury cases on board to be through this and, and be able to do what Hawaii people, we are an Asian Pacific culture, put people in a position to get back on their feet 
and move forward their own ways at their own pace with their own resources and some help. And so where are you seeing the greatest support for that? So the, the, the process has been really interesting since we opened up the fund on, on March 1st. Um, when we opened it up um, on March 1st, the initial applicants were almost um, exclusively pro se parties, so they didn't have lawyers. And we saw a, a number of, of individuals that were applying um, on behalf of, of their, their families, and they got their families together because that's one of the things that's required. And so for the first month or so, most of the applications that we saw were from pro se parties. And then the interesting thing that happened was that as we got towards the end of April and, and then the beginning of May, we began to see an uptick in the number of applications that were coming from individuals who were represented by counsel. And one of the things that, that we think has gone on is that what we wanted the fund to do was to provide an opportunity for conversations to take place within families. From the very beginning, the governor has made it clear that this fund is voluntary and that there may be very good reasons why individuals may decide that the best course for them and their families is to go through the litigation process. But we wanted to make sure that that at least if somebody wanted to avoid that or if a family didn't want to have that kind of stress, they could. And what we think happened is that as beginning in April, those hard conversations began taking place between lawyers and, and individuals. And after those conversations took place, an appreciable number of, of individuals represented by counsel have gone ahead and actually submitted application. I would say that's one of the more interesting things that we've seen over the last, say, four to six weeks. We're closing down the fund on June 15th to begin then the processing of those claims, uh, which will take hopefully 60 to 90 days after that. But that's, that's the trend line that we had. Um, and, and it's been very interesting following you know, how, those, how those applications have come in. Fantastic. And it, it leads to an observation and a question. One is that we've seen attorneys actually advertise to assist people in applying to the fund rather than to advertise for mass claims representation and the classic tort lawsuit approach. And the question it generates is, have there been community forums, meetings, opportunities for people to meet in person with Ohana, one Ohana representatives and people to get information to see if it might work for them? Yeah, that's a great question, Chuck. And that's been one of the things since the beginning that we wanted to make sure would happen. Um, you know, Judge Ibarra has been extremely visible in the Maui community. He's met with the Maui County Bar Association. He's met really with anybody that's, that's really wanted to talk about the program. But most importantly, what he has done is that he's also taken the time to meet with the individual families that 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 suffered losses in in the in the fire, and I think that those one-on-one -on -one conversations have been extremely important in in allowing individuals to make a decision as to what the right course is as well. Um, the other thing that's happened is that Governor Green has also taken a very personal sort of role as it relates to outreach, and I think given his background as a physician and an emergency room physician and somebody who was used to taking care of a large neighbor island uh, practice where he had six or 7,000 uh, people that he was taking care of. He's taken a personal interest in this. He's gone over to Maui on multiple occasions. He's met with victims' families in his office um, and talked with them and gone through their options. And, you know, not every single one of them has decided that that's the, the that the one Ohana fund is the best approach. But I, I think I'm proud to report that a lot of them have. And I think that the, the fact that there is that sort of human interaction where uh, when the governor is talking to a victim's family, it's not a conversation about money. It's really a question of, of like making sure that that the governor um, is expressing, you know, his his um, you know, sincere belief that that what everybody has gone through in Hawaii generally is a tragedy, but what these families have gone through is even more of a tragedy. And starting out with, you know, 
relating to the families in that kind of way, where he's connecting with them and mourning with them, um, that, 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 that sort of, you know, connection in, in many ways, as you know, a lot of times when you're looking at trying to resolve uh, disputes, the, the, the dollars and cents are oftentimes important, but a lot of times it's that emotional connection where somebody is able to express like what their loss has been and somebody that is listening to them. And, and I think because the governor is obviously the, the political leader of the state, that they're getting that sort of ability to talk to somebody and to get acknowledgement about their loss. I think that's been one of the hallmarks of why this program has been so successful so far. You know, and it, it, that also generates a couple observations and a question. One of the observations is that, from my experience as mediator of civil cases for almost 40 years, including some recent extremely sensitive, tragic, mental, emotional harm cases, we understand that while the deaths and the serious physical injuries are, are tragic, the mental, emotional harm, including to people who have not necessarily been physically injured, is one of the most tragic and long-term impacts of the Maui fires. We also understand, as you've just brought up, an insight that is uniquely Hawaii, and that is we are not individuals here. We are units. We are part of families. Our meaning, our value is in our role in our families. We are extended families. We are communities. We are neighborhoods. We are towns. Lahaina is a town with an identity, with a cultural value and integrity that deserves to be understood and respected. And of course, in the lawsuits, and the attorneys represent individuals. Nobody's really representing the community, and that needs to be understood and addressed. And it almost seems like you and the governor's program and your team, including Judge Ibarra, one of, one of the most wonderful legal, professional, and personal character, integrity people you and I have ever met. I mean, he's the perfect guy for that role. If I were going to have a Maui family meet with anyone who would truly help them feel heard, respected, understood, honored, appreciated, Ronnie Barra would be at the top of the list. And I, I hope he is as appreciated for his service as, as you are, I hope, for yours. I, I'm not sure that the people who have not yet opted in have seen how well and how meaningfully this program can work. I'm not sure those people and their lawyers have talked to the people who have opted in to sit down and say, what did you think about? What were the choices? How did you see them? Why did you make this choice? And I'm not sure that for those people who have not opted in, that at least having the opportunity to have those conversations might not be a benefit to them. I, I think it might well be a benefit to them to understand how those who have made the choice, how they got there and how that might relate to their situation. They still might decide, no, it's still, it's not right for us. But at least if they understand how a family sees it and makes that decision, it might give them a perspective that no lawyer can. And so one of the questions it leads to is, if at this time, where there are now less than 10 days before the deadline, if you get to that deadline and you announce where you are, and even if you can go forward with those who have opted in, might it be worth considering one more 30-day window to make not only yourself and Judge Ibarra, but some of the people who would volunteer to share how they see this, how they see the choice, how they made that choice, available to the people who still haven't really decided one way or another. There must be, out of the remaining 52 people or however many, and any of the injury people, if there are any, there must be some of them who are not 
resolutely, permanently, firmly, we've seen the choice, we've understood your choice, we've made the Some of the people who are still open to saying, you know, we might want to think about that one more time. And to do that with the benefit of understanding half of the death cases and a majority of the injury cases have weighed all the choices and consequences carefully, some with advice of counsel, and have chosen this is the best for us to understand why. Yeah, so that's a that's a that's a great question, and I mean, I think that we have balanced um, a number of factors in in making the decision to to close the fund um, on June fifteenth. We've actually we're on our second extension right now. We originally right. were going to close the fund on April thirtieth. We had a number of requests that came in, both from victims' families and attorneys, that asked for some extra time because they were still working with the family. So we extended it until May 31st. We had a few more requests, and those were then wrapped up. Um, we were then wrapped those discussions up by saying we'll do one more 15-day extension. So that's where that's where we got the June 15th. I, I, I think there's a couple of things related to your question, though, that that um, that may end up being factors down the line. The the way that the fund works is that the the that once the fund closes, which is what we're going to do on June 15th, the fund contributors collectively can make a decision down the line to reopen or to roll those funds into some other settlement vehicle. They don't have to do that, but they can do that. And so one of the things that we've talked about is that by allowing the fund to shut down and having us then focus on processing the claims, one of the things that we want to be able to do and to focus our attention on is to actually have the people that applied back in March and April begin to see their process is getting wrapped up and that the funds are actually starting to, to show up. And I think at the end of all of this, one of the things that we believe is that if we have families that not only trusted in the, in the fund and the process that we described, but are then at the very end of it seeing that, wow, we got this thing done in 60 to 90 days like we were promised, then the thought is that, that there may be another opportunity for us to go back as contributors and say, we now have a track record. We've demonstrated that we can do this. And, you know, every day there is something that is new that is learned in the in the litigation. And, and so as the lawyers that are working on those cases are going through them, they may begin to reevaluate the way that they view the fund. Because I do know that there are some skeptics among the plaintiff's lawyers who, who are telling us that they don't believe that we can wrap up these claims in 60 to 90 days. And they're they're telling their clients, no, that's not possible. We think this is going to take a year or two. And so I think for us, some of this is the proof in, in actually going through and demonstrating that we're able not only to accept claims, but to wrap them up and to have them actually like be completed. And so I think, Chuck, at the end of all of this, it doesn't for for you know, it doesn't forestall us from coming back and looking at it again. But I think that the the judgment of the of, of certainly Judge Ibarra and some of the people that are advising him was that what we should do is let's go ahead and let's process. And at the end of that, we, we can then reconsider the idea of, of reopening if that makes sense. So that's where we are, at least at this point in time in the process. The only way to show people that that process and the people yourself, Governor Green, Ronnie Barra, and the others involved in making this work can be trusted to do that is to do it. Nobody is suggesting that should be delayed, impaired, impacted in any adverse way. In fact, it needs to be shown effective. And I think the point that you've just made by inference is once that is shown, and that's publicly available information, and the attorneys who have been skeptics see that you can make good on your commitments to those people in your process, in your one Ohana healing process. Some of them 
particularly clients. And some attorneys may come back and say, maybe we should take another look. But secondly, and even more important, the other point you've made, Andy, and I have unlimited admiration for your insights and perspective, is people's lives change all the time. What if one of the people or families that didn't opt in has a family emergency, an illness, an injury, a death of an income earner, something that impacts them in a way that says, you know, this might now be the better choice for us. To be available, and, and when you go back to the funding sources, and there may be additional ones once they see how well what you do works, waiting to see if that can work. <clears throat> that not only the original funding sources, but maybe others kind of waiting on the sidelines to see if, or contributors who have contributed limited amounts who may say, you know what, if this can work that well, we may be willing to invest more. Because look at the return on the investment for the defendants, for the respondents, for the people who are sued, for the private entities, the utilities, the landowners, for the public entities, the state and Maui County, to have the assurance and the peace of mind to say, if we contribute as requested to this, the return on investment for us is both we and the victim's families can collaboratively conclude our part of this. There are others out there we're gonna to have to deal with. But for many of these people who choose to take our offer of help, we can provide it, we can stand behind it, we can make it work for them. And we can show those who are on the fence that this can be available. So I think you're right, because when you and Tracy Wilkin are inspiring community mediation center leader for many decades, and one of our favorite people ever, when we met for coffee within a few weeks after the fires, one of the first insights you shared is this is a multi-door process. Door number one may be death and serious injury, not only door number two may be property damage and income loss and interruption, and door number three may be the community, and there may be others, but door number one doesn't necessarily close because phase one of the process completes. That point that you've made, this is a process for people. This is an offer for healing and support for people. And your ability to do it in a way that makes it that multi-door process and leaves those doors open, as Leonard Cohen put it, the crack where the light gets in to do that. I, I don't think anyone else could have inspired and achieved that with as skeptical a community of people as you have been dealing with for the last nine, almost 10 months. Kudos, it's, I'm amazed. Well, I mean, you know, I've, I've been blessed to be surrounded by, you know, a number of other people. I mean, I, 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 I've been able to work with, you know, a terrific team, but I also would say that, you know, the inspiration for this came from the governor. And as you know, within a week or two after the, the you know, the fire happened, I mean, it, it was one of the first things that he wanted to focus on. It's that we have to do what we can to help heal those families who've suffered, you know, the the the, the ultimate losses as a result of, of what happened um, in Lahaina in particular. And so, you know, having him make it clear that we need to do this as a state on behalf of the community, this is the right thing to do. And then, you know, what was been what has been, I think, you know, exhilarating and doing the work is that along the way, um, we've been able to to get as partners, you know, all sorts of different entities. I mean, you've got large, you know, communications companies that are involved in this. You have, you know, the largest private landowner in the state of Hawaii that also happens to have an, an incredibly important charitable purpose, you know, as well. Um, you have a, a you have a couple of governmental entities, and so those different entities and the culture 
of those entities had to get behind this idea. And we, I think we're able to do that. And I think that there has been skepticism. There's no question. The plaintiffs and some of the plaintiff's attorneys have been skeptical. We had skepticism from the legislature as to like what we were doing and why we were doing it. Um, I will say though, that when we finish this work up someday, um, my guess is, is that the governor and I and the team that we're working on and, and Ronnie Barra being, you know, at the front of that line as well, I think we're all going to look back and, and see this as some of the best work that we ever did in our career and some of the most important work that we've done. So, you know, we're, we still have a long, long way to go. Um, you know, some days it feels like we've been at this for years and other days it feels like time has just rushed by. And I, I don't see us wrapping up our work in a matter of weeks, but I've seen progress every once in a while. I always tell you know people when I worked in government and I had staff, every once in a while you gotta take, you gotta take stock, smell the roses, take a look back and see what you've accomplished because that's what's gonna nourish your soul when you go forward. And so every once in a while, I do give myself the luxury of thinking back to those early days and then looking what we've achieved you know, so far. But then I realized we just have a lot more, you know, to do. Um, but seeing that we've been able to achieve, I think, gives our team at least, you know, the hope and um, the energy, you know, to to go forward and say this is important work. We're headed in the right direction. We're coming up with a solution that would not have happened any other place in the country, and we're going to be proud of this when we're done. So, you know, that's that's where we are, you know, as we take stock you know, after this fund has been open a little bit over, you know, three months, but took a good six months to design. You know, that's where we see this heading and, and, and you know, being able to see, you know, some of those families actually be able to get the closure that they want. That will be a meaningful thing when we get to see it. What you have from the very beginning been building is not only a uniquely Hawaiian creation for a uniquely Hawaiian situation. Lahaina is a, a Hawaiian Filipino community with cultural roots as the original capital of the kingdom that are absolutely unique. There is nowhere in California or Louisiana or anywhere else comparable culturally, geographically, or in human terms, the human environment terms. You've approached it from the beginning collaboratively as a team. You have brought people in to work together. And Josh Green, who, whom I admire immensely and give huge credit, probably a little biased as the son, the brother-in-law, the uncle and close friend of doctors for all of my 78 years. He looked at this the way that a healer would look at it, triage it, diagnose it, treat it, and heal it, and be there for the follow-up. Because after the surgery of the financial relief, there will have to be maybe a lifetime rehabilitative process available to those people. You can make financial and other resources and material resources available, but the healing resources that the individuals and the community and the people like you and Ron Ibarra and Governor Green who serve them can make available. Also recognize not just the victims, those adversely impacted by the fires themselves, but those who have been called to account, private and public entities, you are building relationships in a way that no other disaster relief program has ever considered or undertaken. You are building relationships with the utilities that invite and enable them to be partners with the government and the state and the people on renewable energy instead of opponents. For the landowners, particularly Kamehameha schools, that invite them to be partners on education and community building and service 
in ways that have never before been possible. The partnership between the state and the county and those private entities that this collaboration makes possible is something no other event could have made possible. And Andy, you and Governor Green and Ronnie Barra and the rest of your team, you're doing that in ways that I would love to see Civil Beat and the Star Advertiser and TV media appreciate, recognize, and publicize so that people who want to support that and be part of that can. Not only in Hawaii, but beyond. As people see what you're doing and how that serves the individuals and the community and the larger human environment, as you build it, I think they will come. Your thoughts. I think that what we're attempting to do in Hawaii um, in the aftermath of the fire is uniquely Hawaiian. Um, I, I do believe that, that um, the approach that we have taken is one in which, you know, it's infused by, by concepts of community, but also with concepts of aloha and ohana. And, and, and those things are meant to be front and center. I think that we have challenged um, sort of the conventional approach to how you deal uh, with a disaster. Um, and I, I don't want to be critical of the, of the lawyers and the other consultants that have come in, you know, from the mainland to, to advise the various parties on, on how to go about looking at what's happened uh, as a result of these fires. But I think that the thing that we've learned over those months is that they have some knowledge to contribute, but that their knowledge a lot of times ends up only going so far because they're not understanding the heart and soul of Hawaii. And in, in order to resolve um, what we're trying to resolve, which is we're looking backwards. We, we, we have to. We have to look at, at how, do you, how do you provide you know, a degree of, of, of whether it's compensation or acknowledgement that something has happened that needs to be acknowledged. But I think that what we're also trying to do, and, and this is very, very much front and center in, in the minds of, of Governor Green and the rest of our team, is we want to look forward. We want to take what has happened, learn the lessons that, that we need to learn as a result of what happened last year, build on that, and then and then end up coming up with the solution that the community is comfortable with, that the state is comfortable with. And I think that if we do that, I do think that there will be some lessons that can be learned by the rest of the country when they're facing disasters like this. And, and people come in and want to tell you, well, here's how you do it. Here's the cookie cutter approach to solving this problem. And having sat through a number of presentations that, frankly, I did think were cookie cutter. And, and maybe that's what they were going to do in California, or maybe that's what they did in Puerto Rico. Uh, maybe that's what they did in Oregon. And I don't discount any of it. There were things to be learned from all of those tragedies. But ultimately, the solution that we need to come up with, which is going to be multifaceted, it's going to involve settlement of lawsuits, but it's also going to involve changes in policy and the way that we look at things um, as it relates to climate, because at its core, we are looking at climate change and the impacts that it is having on the state of Hawaii. And we happen to be on the front line of that. And people around the country, I think, are gonna learn lessons from the way that we react to this, because whether or not you have a disagreement on what's causing climate change, I don't think there are many people that deny that it is happening and it's having severe impacts around the country. And that is what we are grappling with as well. How do you rebuild community? How do you address what's gonna happen with climate change as we look 20, 50, 100 years in the future? And then how do you acknowledge the tragedy that has happened? You have to include all of those elements if you're gonna come up with a solution that is actually going to address what happened in Maui last year and what we need to do as a, as a society and as a community to make sure it never happens again. Those are the elements. And I think if we do it right, 
I think that there will be a lot of lessons that others can learn. I don't think it could be said any better than you just did. And one of the impressions that generates is for the skeptics, the resistance, maybe large lawyers, maybe people who feel like the California wildfires model or the Deepwater Horizon model or Oregon model or whatever might work here. As they see not just what you're doing and offering, but how people see and respond to that and what you're able to do with that together collaboratively for the individuals and the community, maybe they will begin to see that should they choose to be part of that process, to participate, to collaborate, to support, that the benefit not only to their clients, but to themselves, not only materially and financially, but in human terms, in meaning, in value, the things that we take with us into our families, into our lives and take forward. As they perceive that's the difference in what you offer, it's not just culturally appropriate, it's an exercise of human understanding, respect, and responsibility that is not adversarial, that is not partisan, that is not served by those processes that may generate great financial returns in five to 10 years or not, at whose expense, at expenses we cannot here in Hawaii at this time afford. Neither the victims, nor the defendants, nor the county, nor the state, nor any of us. Do you see any indications of glimmers of understanding and appreciation in that resistant, skeptical group? It has been a challenge to get um, individuals and lawyers in particular who are used to dealing with what they view as a legal problem um, in a different and, and broader uh, sort of context. Um, and I, I can't say that we're at the point where everybody is on the same page yet. Um, I, I would love to be able to report that that everybody has has seen the light and the clouds <laughs> come up and you know everybody is ready to, to, to do what's necessary to get this re resolved. But one of the things that the governor has done as we now are, are shifting, if you will, to the rest of what we're trying to do um, in looking at, at the legal claims that have come out of, of the wildfires is to take sort of the spirit of the One Ohana Fund. And it's not going to be like, let's do One Ohana Fund and now let's do the second Ohana Fund. But it's more, let's take the approach where we figured out what's important to Hawaii and made that and infused that into what became the One Ohana Fund. As we're now looking at the rest of the claims and how we go about doing those, the bottom line is from the standpoint of the governor and I think his closest advisors is that what we think is a trap is that if we follow simply a traditional tort litigation approach to resolving these claims. And if we do that, I, I don't think in the end that it will provide adequate compensation, to be honest. I, I mean, it, it, you know, there may be money that exchanges hands, but I think that worse what it will do, if we, if we think of it just in terms of a court litigation settlement model, is that we will ravage the community in the process and make it more difficult for Lahaina to reemerge from what happened last year. If, if we simply say we're going we're gonna to write a few checks and we're going to let that money go offshore, whether it's to owners of, of property or businesses that don't live in Hawaii, whether it's lawyers that are representing plaintiffs that are not from Hawaii, that they are able to take those settlements and move offshore. And all of those dollars that we're talking about as they leave Hawaii, 
that leaves us that much poorer when it comes to rebuilding Lahaina and rebuilding that community in a way that the people of Lahaina want to see it rebuilt. Like it or not, we're going to need we're going to need resources to do that. Um, that's not going to come out of nowhere. We are a small state. We are a resource limited state. And so as we have looked at how to approach settlement, we've made it clear, the governor has made it clear that he is not going to be in favor of a settlement that ends up crippling the state and crippling Maui and crippling Lahaina. I think finally, we're starting to make progress. I'm cautiously optimistic in seeing the progress that we've made. Um, that there may be some ability over the next few months to make progress and get to a point that we come up to a solution that will be good for the state and good for the people of Maui and good for Lahaina. Um, but I can't tell you that it's been easy. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's the, the easiest thing in, the, in, in this process would be to say, okay, here's the number the plaintiffs want. Here's what the defendants can do. Let's get to a number in the middle to sign a release and we're done. I think if we do that, that would be a horrendous mistake. And the governor has made it clear that he does not favor that. And fortunately, um, I think his leadership is starting to have an impact on some of the skeptics. And one of the things that we know, and we've seen very, very recently graphically, <clears throat> unavoidably, 24-7, 365, is that this U.S. adversarial partisan legal system, besides being protracted, besides being extremely expensive, it is incredibly unlimitedly divisive and destructive, not only to those who participate in it directly, but to those who are impacted by its effects. It's I don't want to overstate this. I don't want to engage in hyperbole, but its impacts are like those visually. If you see a recreation of the Hiroshima or Nagasaki bomb and the waves after that initial mushroom cloud, that is the worst of what our adversarial partisan litigation system, which I've participated in for 45 years, and I'll try and help people get through in out-of-court mediation, and, and you do in this case, you're offering them a responsible, human, objectively fair, expedited, reduced cost healing process that has a financial component, but it also has a relationship building, a team building, a consensus building component that they can take forward as individuals, as part of a community, that the litigation process not only cannot offer, but it engages in attempting to break down. That's the choice. So I see you have some thoughts on that. What I was going to say is that, you know, one of the things, you know, both of us have been mediators for many, many years. And I think that one of the things that I think both of us take to heart is mediators. And, you know, when you start a mediation and you're talking to the parties and you're describing the benefits of mediation, one of the things that both of us probably have said many, many times is the beauty of mediation is that you're not locked into the constraints of a of a litigation solution, of a, of a solution that is that is imposed by the court system, and that you can go outside of that. You can bring pieces into a resolution that would not be possible within a case that goes to trial and then goes up on appeal. And, you know, I've thought about that a lot over the last few months, because what we're talking about in trying to come up with a resolution is exactly that which is we are, we are asking uh, parties and attorneys that are extremely experienced, who've done these cases all over the country, to understand that when we're having a discussion about resolution, we're not bound by whatever the compensation or the, the, the process by which you have um, a, a resolution of a case in court. 
take those blinders off and come into this situation with the understanding that you can come in and we can have a conversation that goes far beyond what would happen in court. We can talk about what is the future of Lahaina going to look like? How are we going to rebuild it? What is the energy future of Hawaii going to look like? And how does what happened to Lahaina last year play into it? How is the state going to deal with the impacts of climate change? And how can we use what happened in Maui last year to learn from it and do something about it? That's what we're trying to do. And if we are able to get people to open their eyes to that, then I think that the solution in many ways is, is going to become somewhat self-evident. It's going to be complicated. It's going to look different than anything that anybody has ever done. But at the end, if we're addressing all of those things, then I think that we can walk away from what happened in, in Lahaina last year in Maui generally and say, we learned our lessons, we made Hawaii a better place. And, and as a state, as a society, as a community, we're going to be better as a result of it. That's where we want to get. And I think, like I said, it's required leadership by the governor. It's required a fair amount of cajoling from those of us who are working for the state. We've got some great partners now that are standing shoulder to shoulder with us who are also delivering that kind of message as well. Kamehameha Schools, I think, has a vision for its lands and for the benefits of those lands and what those trust assets are supposed to be used for. That has to be fused into what we're doing. And if we're not paying attention to that, then we're not not going to come up with a solution that ultimately is going to be lasting or is going to do what's going to be necessary for us to come up with the, the, the right approach to, to getting this thing resolved. I am hopeful that, that, you know, if we continue to lead in this way, that we'll be able to get people to understand that there may be many paths to settlement, but if we don't listen to these various factors and address them, will be making a huge mistake. So again, my hope is I see glimmers of optimism after a few months of darkness. I can actually look at like a puzzle where I can kind of see the outline now, Chuck, and I can see where some of the pieces fit. I can't tell you I would have had that six months ago. And, you know, hopefully we have some great mediators that are involved in helping us at this point. And my hope is that once they are able to understand clearly what it is that can be done here, that with their help and guidance, we can get to a solution. You know, and you're exactly right. I mean, Peter Cahill, the Maui judge who is in charge of virtually all the Maui case, fire cases. I've known Peter for many, many years. I have literally unlimited Aloha and respect and appreciation for him. It, probably the greatest good fortune of Hawaii, if you were going to have four people, central, and actually five people in Hawaii, central in responding to the tragedies of the Maui fires and generating a culturally collaborative healing approach that people could join in for mutual benefit. I don't think you could find five better people than Peter Cahill, you, Governor Green, Keith Hunter, Peter's appointed co-mediator with retired LA judge Lou Meisinger, also highly respected gentleman and well chosen for this, and Ronnie Barra. We have a team of five people and as you've alluded to, there are other shoulder-to-shoulder, arm-in-arm supporters in this. Um, the utilities have people whose leadership may be available supportively rather than resistantly. Kamehameha Schools has people, um, and there are others, Maui County certainly, the state certainly. On the legislative side, how do you see this year's legislative response to the situation? Favorable, unfavorable, on the fence? I think that they did a couple of things. I mean, I think they addressed the um, the immediate impacts of the fire and did a, 
I think, a very, very good job in terms of like providing the resources for housing and the, the aid that's necessary after that to begin looking at like, how do we physically prevent a fire from happening again? How can we have a better emergency response? I think those parts of, of the legislative session were good. Um, I think that we're, we fell down and I don't blame the legislature by the way, entirely. I mean, I think that some of this um, falls on the, the shoulders of those who were advocating for sort of the forward looking solutions. And I, and I don't necessarily blame the state or the utility either, because I think that, that we started the legislature a session in less than five months after the fire. And so I think that the places that we have work to do um, are in things like resilience. Like we need to figure out a way to raise capital in order to make sure that Hawaii is more resilient and is able to deal with the impacts of climate change. And figuring out how that's going to be done is, a, is an immense challenge. There's not an easy solution. I understand if, you know, that rate payers in the state of Hawaii are not necessarily going to be particularly you know, enthralled with the idea that their rates are going to go up to allow Kiko to pay for a settlement. And, and we heard that loud and clear. But the question is, would they be of a mind to allow some rate increase if what that's being done is not to allow HECO to resolve its claims, but to do things like burying you know, utility poles, making sure that houses are more ready in the event that there is a, you know, another disaster. And so I, I think that that's an area that needs exploration. The second area that I think also needs exploration is we need to think through, like, how do we make sure from the standpoint of, of compensation, if we have another mass disaster, you know, what does that look like? How do we make sure that we have that safety net? And whether that looks like reinsurance or a rainy day fund, those are things that we need to look at as well. And the heels of the legislative session, the governor stood up the climate um, advisory team that's being uh, chaired right now by Chris Benjamin, and we'll probably have some additions to it in the near future. That's exactly the set of questions that that, that team is looking at, and it's getting ready to put together recommendations that will go to the legislature. And I think that if that team is able to come up with a logical set of, 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 of recommendations that have been like vetted by the community with outreach, and that we are then able to build a consensus before we get to the next legislative session, that we can tackle those problems. And so I, I don't, like I said, I think that we didn't get where we wanted to get to, but I don't think that that was a failure of the legislature or necessarily a failure of the state or anybody else. I don't think we were necessarily ready at that point in time to have that far reaching conversation. I think we're gonna be ready by, by the beginning of the next legislative session. And so in terms of judging how it is that we do as a political system, I would defer judgment until next year. If we can get to these issues next year, I think that there's still time to address them. So that's that's how I would evaluate what, what's happened so far. We, we get, I think, a, a good solid grade for looking backwards and also looking at how to do emergency re response. I think we get an incomplete for the rest, which I think we can take up in the next session. Tell us a little bit about, is there a working group that's really going to put top priority on investigating, evaluating, understanding, coming up with recommendations on exactly these issues, resilience, climate change, disaster preparedness? That's actually the climate advisory team. That's actually what they're tasked with doing. I thought you were gonna ask about the fire. There are fire investigations that are being done by Maui County, the attorney general. That's obviously yeah. different. Yeah. But this particular set of issues, that's, the, that's what the climate advisory team has been tasked with doing. Where do you see the most fertile ground for positive movement both in terms of Maui fire individual and community relief recovery and healing, 
and, and the larger issues, the climate change, the resilience. What's your vision? My vision, um, which gets revised almost on a daily basis, is that, you know, as I look at the solution for the, the lawsuits, it has to be a community-based solution. I think we have to break the model of just saying the only way to resolve this is, you know, money goes from defendants to plaintiffs and that's it. I think that if we are not looking at how we're going to rebuild Lahaina in that process, that will be a mistake. And I think that that has to be taken into account. And if we do that, it also then opens up other ways that you could look at contributions to a settlement. And so I think that's that's how I see that looking. I think for the future, that's a work in progress. And this is going to be something that that you know, we need to take a look at what models are going to work for Hawaii that allow us, I think, to build resilience and to build that into the system. And then also to be able to have a way of looking at future catastrophes and understanding that those investments are going to be long term ones. And that's really difficult. I mean, what you're basically asking people to do is to say, OK, we're going to take money and instead of dealing with a set of immediate problems, we're going to slice a piece of that off and move it to, you know, down the line. And we may never need that money, but we're going to set that funding up, but we're going to economize as a result of that. That's where we need to get to. And that's a challenge. The good thing is for Hawaii, though, is built into our uh, core is the notion of future generations and taking care of the next generation. And I think that if we're able to ground those arguments in, this may not be for us, but this is for our children and our grandchildren, I think that that message will resonate. So that's where I think we're heading. And I think, like I said, community to solve the, the lawsuits, understanding that we're going to need to sacrifice a little bit for future generations to make the state a better place and a safer place to be. I think that's, that's where I hope we end up. About out of time for today, although we could do this for another several hours. Last thoughts, parting thoughts? You know, I, I, I would say that, you know, the, the people of Hawaii have been unbelievably open to, you know, making sure that they're taking care of the people in Maui. And sometimes I think that can try their patience a little bit on occasion. I think there's a, a little bit of, of fatigue after nine or 10 months. But, you know, I, I, I still believe in the resilience of, of, of the soul of the place. And I think we have an opportunity over the next few months to show that we've learned from all of this. And it may be Pollyannish to, to say this, but I think that we can get to a solution that is a, as a state we'll be proud of and that we can come out of this together and say, we suffered a terrible tragedy, but we came out better for it. That's where I think the governor is leading us. That's where I hope we 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 land. And you know, I will welcome the chance, hopefully, to come back in a few months. And you know, if if you know everything works out correctly, hopefully, be able to tell you about a solution that all of us can be proud of. And I absolutely believe you will. And one of the things, and we'll leave you folks who watch this with. Imagine some of those families most adversely harmed by the Maui fires being part of this solution, this collaborative, human, responsible, respectful, understanding solution, and getting to share with all of us what that means to them what their life is able to look like because they get that help, because they get that healing in a way that respects and honors and serves them and their family. That's the difference. Andy, for your vision, for your dedication, and for your team. Governor Josh Green, mediator Keith Hunter, administrator Judge Ronnie Barra, and and all the others who help and support. Thank you all. Think Tech Hawaii, thank you for joining us.